nothing screams financial freedom like yeah. having to share a room with six other people. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Josh. I'm 32 years old, and I was part of World Financial Group from 2019 to 2021. So Josh, what made you decide to go down the route of financial freedom and becoming a billionaire with the WFG? <laughs> oh man, there's really only a very select handful of people that are actually making that kind of money. It's a long-winded story. I'll try to keep it short. So I'm originally from Saskatchewan. Uh, my educational background is actually in environmental management. I got it that degree out in Vermilion, and I had a classmate who was living out in Oak Tokes, and she got a job, a, a place, sorry, and she was looking for a roommate. So I was back home, kind of doing what I was, I used to do. I used to work in a hospital. So she, she hit me up. She was like, Josh, you want to come be roommates? And I had really nothing to lose. So I was like, sure, why not? Uh, so I packed my stuff, I moved, and I kind of had my mind where I was like, hey, I'm in, going to like near Calgary. This is oil central. I should have no problem with applying what I learned. Nope, did not happen. So I'm burning through my savings slowly, and it got to the point where I had to kind of swallow my pride and got a job at work, working at Tim Hortons. Something basic, something that everyone should know how to do. Uh, so one of the people that I was working with, let's fast forward a couple of years, we ended up being roommates and he ended up working at a uh, other place. And one of his coworkers' wives hits him up to do WFG, which I get the phone call being like, hey, you want to come support blah, blah, blah. And of course, being a good roommate, I'm like, sure, why not? I'm 28 at that time. So I was already kind of at that point where I was like, I really need to start thinking about saving for retirement and getting my, you know, being a grown up here. So I go to the events thinking I might have, you know, I'll find some answers to my questions because I had no idea what WFG was, what they did. I just knew that they kind of was a financial institution. So I go see their presentation and I'm like, sure. Like they, then they come up at you afterwards and they ask like, what did you think? Do you have any questions? And of course, because I already have in my mind, like, yeah, I do have questions because I want to start investing for retirement. We set up a separate meeting a different day, which then they, go more in depth on the numbers. And of course you're like, oh my God, wow, this looks really awesome. I already have where I am working a minimum wage job. I am looking for some form of direction in my life. And the idea of going into finances kind of already was a interest of mine just because it is one of those industries that can, you can make a lot of money in it if you're good at it. And I also have really good budgeting skills. And then I put myself through school and during the time after school to when I moved, I saved up quite a bit of money just because I budget. So I, sure, I was like, sure, why not? Sign me up to get started. It was like five, in total, it was like $500 to get started with WFG. So I was like, okay, that's not, not a problem. The first payment was like $160, which went to, it's like um, a training course with the government. The licensing. Yeah, the licensing. And then, then eventually you have to actually go. I went to the Alberta Insurance Council, which you have to then write exams and pay for it. You also have to do a, um, a background check. Luckily, right. because I live out in the country, technically, I didn't have to pay for it. So I was like, yay, I saved like $100. <laughs> right. And what were the other costs? There was the uh, exam, whatever fees they charged, and then what were the costs to WFG themselves? Oh, there was a, there was a back 
office um, fee, like, which I can't, it made sense because like when you're, especially pre COVID, cause you're there, you're using the printer, they need to keep their lights on. So I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense. It was like, I think $90 a month. 90 <laughs> a month for fucking the printer? <laughs> Apparently. Fuck yeah. that printer. In retrospect, I was like, man, I should not have given them a single fucking Dude, sense, but, if, you know, if, less... if there's a hundred people all paying $90 a month, you're not it's... ever going to convince me that that's for printer paper. And to be honest, the office I was in was massive. There is no reason for it. That's insane. That's the most expensive back think, office I've ever heard of. I can't remember the real numbers for the amount of agents that was in the office I was in, but they were projecting like at least 5,000 agents <laughs> within the Calgary area. I'm just like, oh boy. <laughs> Talk think... about uh, market saturation. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 so uh, that's one of the things that's so nonsense about MLM is like, why would you go and recruit your next door neighbor to sell the same thing you're selling and be your competitor if your goal is to actually make sales? It's such an obvious, obvious pyramid scheme. And they'll try to say things like, well, it's because think about McDonald's. They open up a McDonald's on every block and they're franchising. I'm like, yeah, because the demand is there. For McDonald's, McDonald's feeds 1% to 2% of the population every single day in but, North America. But not only that, but if you think about McDonald's, like when they think about putting up another one, they will look at the geography, they'll look at the demographics of that area. And then the, most times, the person that is building that McDonald's has already have McDonald's in the area. Right. Most likely. So and it's like, a it's... The revenue is technically probably going to the same person. Exactly. It, it is pretty monopolistic in that way because it's, I think, a million dollars to open a McDonald's. Plus you have Something to, like that. Yeah, plus you have to go to McDonald's University to be trained as like a franchisee. Plus uh, there's a huge disclosure process when you open a fast food franchise. They tell you about the financials. They, you get to look at the books. And you actually do get to own something as a franchisee. Whereas in, oh, yeah. you know, in WFG, sorry. You, you own you absolutely you, nothing. I'm sorry to right. anyone that's in an MLM, but you are not your own boss. Yeah. I'm my own boss. I have a business. I pay GST. I am insured. I am licensed. I have a business number. I report to the government. That's being your own boss. And on top of it, I make my own, I make my own, uh, I can't find my words. Sorry. Like I charge what I want. Exactly. I get to decide that. When yep. you're working for an MLM, you, God, the payout, the payout contract for WFG is disgustingly sad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and also when you own your own business, you get to decide what you sell, how you market it. You know, there's no, oh, yeah. there's no rules around what you can and can't post on social media. Like you can, you literally, it's so obvious, but anyways, hold on. I want to stay on the topic of, of your, uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I want to stay on you getting recruited. So aside from the, right. so aside from the back office and the licensing costs, what was the actual cost that you paid to join WFG or like other stuff that they, they incentivized you to buy when you joined? I can't, think right off the hop when you join but I, I do remember throughout being in WFG there is usually like special um, courses like take this one like this weekend where we dive into how to like super recruit or double down in your business for like the low payment of like a hundred dollars or right. they'll be like, hey, buy like this special calendar for $30 so you can enter in like business details, like like uh, contact numbers and all this stuff. It's like they are trying to milk as much money out of these. And I should uh, preface this saying that even the, the agents within any MLM, I firmly believe are victims themselves, even if they're perpetuating the system and pyramid scheme scheme they were once like me sure. but they got in at a time where they saw profit so to them it's like oh this i'm making money so this is awesome why would i do want to do something else at some point those people who are at the very top 
do, in my opinion, know what they're doing because your success in an MLM is predicated, in my opinion, on one of two things. Either you got in early enough that you're among that top percentile that actually will make money, or you are just so comfortable with misleading people and lying to people about their potential earnings within the company, and you just don't give a fuck because you are making the money. So I do agree with you to a point you know, when I see these people who say I've been in this company 10 years and they actually are making money, to me, most of the time, those people are morally bankrupt scammers, in my opinion. I guess I like to think optimistically that the majority of people aren't That's true. like that. That's true. It's I, true. I really hope. No, you're right. The majority I, are not. I just, I, I think the majority of people um, are, you know, raised and live life to not be assholes. I, agree I like to think I like to think that. So uh, it, it's definitely an issue within our society where these business systems are allowed to exist. Totally, I agree. So, what were the monthly costs that you were paying in World Financial Group? We said back office, the random like there trainings was, they were trying to hit you with, and what else? There was two fees I paid. One was to the office. The other one, I forget where it was allocated. Actually, if you give me a second, I can pull up my 2020 because I, I had to. Sure, sure. No worries. I think it was around like 160 a month, I want to say. 160 a month. So were you also paying for one of their products like to contribute to your uplines oh. volume okay go ahead yeah i i have numbers here sorry i have to move my no you're good for the last year i have 148 as my highest for the month yes gotcha now it's between march april may i have 148 it varied i i could not tell you why it varied but that was the highest I have for 2021. These fees technically didn't start until you became licensed. Right. So once you became licensed, then they were like, all right, now you have to start paying fees. Okay. I see. I see. I think one was to be, to keep like your, um, to be like, ins like, um, ins oh, okay. I think I remember. So you would have to pay errors and omissions. So I think that that's a recurring, um, insurance that you have to have so i think that was where the other half went why did you have to have errors and omissions you have to have errors and omissions in case you fuck up so let's say i am you know taking i'm about to put you into a um a um, product and i accidentally enter in information incorrectly you have the insurance to cover for your mistake. So let me ask you this. How... Was that errors and omissions insurance that you were paying for monthly, did it count as personal volume for your upline? No, that is... So even if I wasn't part of World Financial Group, I would have to have that insurance as far as I'm aware. So who are you paying it to? It is... um, I could not you okay i think it went so actually i think it went to so when we were with world financial group we technically when we got licensed we had to be sponsored by a company the company that sponsored uh us here in calgary was avari okay so when i was entering to become a licensed agent I had to get permission through Avari for them to be like, yeah, I'll sponsor this guy to sell insurance. Okay. And so what do you mean by so sponsor? I, uh, sponsor, like they like a, not promote, but they essentially say, yeah, we'll, we'll um, like vouch. Think like okay. vouch for this person. Okay. Interesting. Like, I don't know if that's what's like everywhere in North America, but that's just how it was here. Got it. Okay, cool. So after this happened, did you end up becoming a boss babe and trying to recruit other people? 
<laughs> uh, I was the worst recruit ever. They hounded you to recruit. Every, every uh, training session that I went to, which was Wednesdays and Saturdays, actually, I think there was, it went through most of the week, but the big, big ones were Wednesdays and Saturdays. And the, they talked nothing about how to recruit, when to recruit, where to recruit, the amount of people you need to recruit in order to scale your business. Because that's the thing. It's like, oh, you're a world financial group agent. You want to do this full time. I was horrible because I was like, that's too scammy. I'm not doing that. I just want to be here to maybe help some families, you know, figure out their financial situation, maybe make some income on the side. Because as I was going through World Financial Group, 2020 hit, I basically lost most sources of income. And I was kind of like, okay, what should I do to increase my income? And for some reason, while everyone was staying at home, no one wanted to clean their houses. So I was like, well, I guess I'll uh, start a house cleaning business. Oh, interesting. So yeah, so that actually really took off throughout the years and that's why I kind of left. I didn't let leave because I thought this is a scam, it's a pyramid scheme, like screw you. I just got to the point where I had to decide. I was like, do I want to double down into what's actually making me money or stay in something where I could potentially maybe not <laughs> make money. Right. So just to clarify, they talked about nothing but recruiting at the meeting. I'd say 98% of the time. Right. There was a few times where they would maybe bring up like, this is the difference between like an RSP and open, right. open non-registered RSP, or right. this is how you would use a, you know, a home equity line of credit. Like just the basic right, right. financial, yeah. what you would ex actually, you could probably Google most things. I've been to several world financial group meetings, either in person or on Zoom. I, and it's, it's the same, bro. They talk about the rule of 72, the power of compound interest, the penalty of if you wait too long to start investing, like the lost. And it's the same every which time. Are it's, like, actually, it's true. But to be fair, like those are concepts that everyone should know. Yes. And time is on our side. So it's like if you start investing early, you have that much more time to compound your interest. Right. But you don't need to go to yeah. WWE to be told. Certainly this. not. And I mean, <laughs> that is all part, that's strategic. They talk about that first. And then they talk about the building the business because in cult methodology, the way that they get you is they tell you a truth uh, or a crumb of truth. And then they start attaching yeah. more extremities to it because you've already they've already built that trust with the recruit by saying things that are objectively true. Like I remember in one company I was spying on, they were saying, would you rather have $10,000 or a penny doubled every day for a month? And then they show, penny yeah, and then they <laughs> show like how the penny is actually worth more. And they're like, see, and everyone in the audience is like, oh, this guy's sick. And then it's like... <laughs> That's enough that to make people you like, don't need yeah, it's enough to disarm people, which is fucking that. ridiculous. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so is it safe to say that you actually didn't really learn anything in terms of finance? And I, I actually, I did learn quite a bit oh, okay. because I did, I did have, which is, I, this is, this is where things get very muddly and very gray because you don't, you do genuinely learn a bit how certain products work if if like they don't talk to you so you have to be actively aggressive in learning the products i can't say for every agent out there i'm sure there are some that just do not care they're cookie cutters they put people into the same products no matter how their situations look you might have some that are genuinely trying to help people that do take into consideration what you can afford and they put into products that they have available to them because that's the thing is world financial group only has products as far as i'm aware that have an insurance tied to it so for example like segregated funds 
that's how we were able to invest is because segregated funds have a level of insurance to it. So we had a, that product available to us, but most should know that segregated funds is not for everyone. This is what I learned afterwards is that maybe 2% of the people really could benefit from a segregated fund. The rest honestly look into mutual funds, but that's the thing. Actually, I, I tried to learn outside of the training. I asked all the product providers questions. I, I tried, I tried to learn and I didn't want to recruit because I saw that it was just, I had the gut feeling I was like, I don't want, it was also because I didn't want to build a business. I just wanted to be my own person and just kind of do my thing, yeah. which I guess means I, I failed. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you didn't fail because you recruiting is not building a business. No, it's not. So, you know, uh, here's the I thing. I mean, in terms of MLM, it's like. Yeah, I, yeah I, that's I, the term they I use. I didn't recruit, right? So. One thing I've never understood about WFG is they always say, when you ask them, what do you do? How do you make money? They always say, well, we teach people about finance. We sit down with them one-on-one. -on -one. We analyze what they need. We restructure their debt. We give them a budget. I'm like, okay. But they don't obviously, really do budgeting. okay, but here's my thing. So you don't actually get paid from doing that. Like sitting down with someone no. and doing a financial consult consultation that doesn't pay you any money. So then already it's misleading, right? So then the question is, I'll ask you to explain from your experience, how do you make money in WFG? What are the ways? <laughs> okay, so the first one is like, let's say I sold you a universal life policy. I would make commission off of that policy. Straight up, as soon as I logged it into the system, it spits out points and then it gets times by what my payout contract was. And your payout contract is determined based on how many recruits you have you're, under you. You're, where you're where you are in the hierarchy. Yeah, right. So do you remember how much the percentage was for someone with no recruits like yourself? 26% for a, for, a, for a policy that's like how expensive could it could vary. Let's uh, let's say, uh, okay, here's one. So a $1,000 annual policy, I probably made like not even a hundred. I made about $160. Okay. So here's the thing that I want people to know watching this in the actual life insurance industry. Like I've been studying companies like Primerica world financial group for a long time. And I've talked to actual financial professionals who do insurance because of my work with these companies or on these companies. And they have all told me that in the real life insurance industry, a brand new broker, salesperson gets anywhere from on the lowest 30%, but in life insurance, it's usually higher up to 90 or sometimes 100% of that first year's premium because the insurance company is going to make their money on the subsequent years when the person resubscribes to the insurance. So they incentivize the salesperson by giving them 100% of the first year. So if that would mean if you sold a $1,000 life insurance policy, you made $1,000, right? So Consider, and in those situations, you don't have to have any recruits. You just get uh, that. You just get that, oh, and you don't have to pay for shit. Like, you would have to pay to be licensed because it's a regulated industry, but MLM takes that and bastardizes it and twists it and makes it into this, like, video game where now when you make the sale, it doesn't just become money. Now it's, like, points, and now I, these points yeah. are calculated so that to determine your commission. I, and it's, it's like, what the fuck? I can't explain you why they do it with a point system. But the best I can come up with is because money, it becomes too weird because you have to take the policy. You have to times it by a constant number based on what the provider is willing to give you. So like, let's say 1.2. So you times that amount by 1.2, that gives you points. And then you take those points, you times it by your- Well, just Josh, to, I'll that tell way, you. It, apparently it makes it easier using it just as a, a no, whole no. number point system. <laughs> no, 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 no. Like, can we just use like in money value? Yes, businesses, businesses do not, 
Real businesses do not overcomplicate the process of intaking money. The reason that they do the points system is to make it more difficult for you, the recruit, to ascertain how much the company owes you. If they're telling you about points and calculations and this is the way it is, first of all, they're fucking lying to you, but it's so that you can... You're unable to figure out, like, think about how complex the calculations are of like, okay, well, you made a sale that's $1,000. That translates to this many points. The points translate to this much personal volume. Then we have to consider how many people are in your downline. So if somebody in your downline makes the sale, they actually will get less commission than you who recruited them. In what other industry does the person at the top of the company who didn't, who wasn't involved with the actual sale make more of a slice of that sale than the salesperson. It it's completely upside down business. Like that would not make it doesn't make any sense for a company to do that. It it shows you that element of if you have more people under you, you will actually make more money off the sale that a recruit three layers down made in your downline. That is to me, in my opinion, solid proof that these companies are pyramid schemes because the only way you can make real money or a livable wage is to have people under you. And that is completely in contrast to what they tell everybody when they join, which is this is a great part-time opportunity if you want. It's a fucking dog shit part-time opportunity. You can't make any money doing that. Based on just the payout contract alone, yeah, it's not worth it. You're, you're, you are destined to be paid nothing With, Dude. for the amount of work you would have to put in. It is not worth it. In fact, you have a better chance of starting your own actual business, which has its own risks, but you know, it, it <laughs> you have a better chance doing it that way. Totally. I mean, look, my thing is if you are such a skilled salesperson, that you could sell four different $1,000 insurance policies every month, like once a week, and nobody charged back, nobody refunded it, right? If you were because that- Because you did it right. Let's say you did it right. Let's yeah. say you did it right. If you were that skilled that you could sell $4,000 independently worth of anything, but you only made like, let's say $250 per transaction, so you sold $4,000 worth of stuff, something and you only made one thousand dollars one quarter of that 25 percent that's such a Best terrible world financial group yeah that's that's such a terrible return on what you were able to do first of all selling four thousand dollars of something is not easy it's a whole if you, lot of hard work let's say you sold i mean i don't know if you want to use your industry that you're in now as an example but what does the average cleaning company charge to clean a house so if you're looking at just general cleaning, it could be anywhere between $60 an hour. That, but it depends. If, if, it, if they have, if they're like a big scale, like Molly maids, yeah, you're looking at about 60. Someone like me who's just says, I'm just a sole proprietor. It's just myself. I, I try and be a little more competitive. Sure. So I, I, so I charge what I think is fair. Let's just go with, let's I, just go with the, the Molly maid standard, right? So let's say, Okay, so let's say for a cleaning company, they charge $60 an hour to clean a house. I don't know how long it takes, a few hours. So, you know. A standard 2,000 square foot house should take you, it takes myself about four. So if there was two people about, it should take them about two hours. To okay, clean two hours. A standard house. So that would be like a, a three, four bedroom house. Yeah, it should take about two hours. So that would mean the client, people. so that would mean the client is paying $120, right? So now, per hour. let's say the, Oh, 120 per hour? It's 60 per person per hour. Okay, so 60 per person per hour. You have two cleaners in there. They're in there for two hours. So 120 per hour, so $240 to clean the house, right? So now let's say yeah. let's say that a cleaning company did $4,000 worth of business in that month. Mind you, they're making that $4,000 in two-hour increments. So this is not a 24-7 out there recruiting people at Walmart, messaging people on Facebook thing. It's just actual time compensation, time labor compensation. If a cleaning company makes $4,000 in a month, 
do you think the cleaning company or the people that worked for that are only seeing 25% of that money go back into their pocket? Of course not. Of they're, course seeing, not. they're seeing way more. Like, what, what's the overhead? The cleaning supplies, if you're bringing in four- Which I, are very cheap. Very cheap. <laughs> it's it's nice. the labor. Yeah. So, the, I mean, I don't want people to get lost in the weeds of like my calculations. My point is that in virtually any other business, at least any business that I can think of, any industry that I can think of, if you make a sale, if it's built on sales, you will receive back into your pocket more than 25% for what you do. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's ridiculous. But I can't even tell you how, how, even with, how you even get blinded by all of it. I think a, a lot of it was because when I sat down with people and I kind of showed them how I could free up, let's say like, they're saying like they are living paycheck to paycheck. They aren't putting anything towards savings. They're racking up debt. And I just use very simple, basic budgeting strategies. And I'm like, hey, this is how you can actually free up $400 a month. It, this is where I was saying about the gray areas because you're, you are legitimately showing people how they can reallocate their spending habits. And then it makes you think that this is a legitimate thing because you're legitimately doing things that you think are going to help people. So, but wait, how does sitting down with them and talking to them about their budget and stuff lead to sales? Like, is it you build that trust and then you convince them that they need some insurance policy? You, I wanna say you almost just accept it. You're just like, oh, okay, well, this is just kinda what I get paid. And I was thankful that I had a side, like my, side business was taking off. So that was my bread and butter. But I am sure there are people out there in this that they solely focused on this one thing. And I feel for those people because yeah, they are getting paid pennies to dollars. I, I want to I wanna rephrase my question here because I, this is the thing that I'm, I'm confused about with a company like Primerica WFG. They claim to do the same thing, right? How does a WFG agent sitting down with someone and analyzing their finances, how does that lead to money for them? Is that is that literally just like a process that's there just to build trust so that you can convince them that they need to buy an insurance policy? Because you're not getting paid to sit down with people. No. So oh, what's okay. the so like right. what's the financial Sorry, incentive? Like why what other thing I, what's the point of it? I, I wanna say it kind of gives them a glimpse of what they can do. And then we say, hey, would you be open to seeing how we can reallocate that money that I just oh, showed I you see. that I freed up? And that's like, okay, let's start planning. Like, okay, we're gonna put, you know, you know, $200, we're gonna put that into like aggressive paying off your debt. I'm gonna put $100 and we're gonna start building an emergency fund. Another $100, Depends. Like, do you want to go I into see. the insurance route or do you want to go into like start putting a little bit into savings? You start playing with it. You start giving them the idea that they're, they now have options. I see. Okay. So, okay. So that's what I, that's what I thought. It's like, Sorry, I, no, 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 no. You're I, good. I misunderstood. No, all good. Okay. So makes sense to me now. They're basically, you're freeing up their money so that it can go to you basically to WFG. I, I get it. So. I mean, uh, but again, from my experience talking to actual industry professionals in insurance, indexed universal life insurance is very rarely the right fit for the average person, especially if they're living paycheck to paycheck. I'm going to say you, you have to be the right person to have universal life. At most, like look into term policies, maybe. I'm, hold on, I'm not even gonna get into that. I'm not a professional right, planner. Right. Don't listen to me. But I'm just saying, if, you, if you're on a budget, but you see the value in insurance, talk to your person about term. Yeah, not financial advice, not official financial <laughs> advice. Yeah. Not, do not yeah, listen yeah. to me about financial advice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these companies really try to sell people on the idea that regular insurance term insurance where you pay each month and then if there's a 
an accident or a claim, they pay out. And if not, you just don't see that money again. I mean, that's what most people understand insurance to be. But these companies try to tell you that that type of insurance is a scam because you could be putting that money towards like a savings that you essentially get back later in its investment. But again, there's so many little... That's risky. It's risky. There's so much fine print that unless you're like... Go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, especially if they picked a fund that is on the higher risk spectrum. Like, yeah, no, no. That's what I'm, like, that's what I'm saying is to, like, I never, I try, I only sold a very few amount of actual UL policies. Did they charge back? But no, oh, no, good. they did not. Good, good. <laughs> because I just, I didn't think they were for everyone. So how did you find people to sell to? Who did you sell to? I uh, at first it you know the go to friends and family, and then it did turn into just having conversations with people. Okay, and so did, did your I, friends and I family was, buy? I did help with my parents. That was a situation in itself. It's um, one of those things where I, I really, I really, I really was very very careful because it's my parents, and I didn't want to fuck it up. <laughs> Good. So I, we spent a lot of time with them and it's just one of those very, it, and they're not the only people that fall into unfortunate financial hardships, but totally. it happens. So, and then for other people that you would find, what do you mean when you say you would find them? Like, where would you talk to people? So, like, if I was, you know, out in the grocery store or, say, walk in the park, you just start striking up conversations. And this is the weird thing, is that they, they, it's like a full-on cult where you just start seeing everyone as, like, a potential client or, for some people, it's recruit. But it's, like, you see, like, you think everyone needs help. And you know what? Here's the thing: not everyone needs help. Yeah, like you do. You don't. You don't need to have these conversations twenty four seven with people. Like it's so disingenuous, and they were constant. And it's a weird thing. I remember in a, quite a few of the training sessions, they were talking about like be genuine when you talk to people. It's like how can you be genuine with someone when your <laughs> sole focus is to eventually have the conversation of right. sitting down and talking about finances. What, like that is not genuine. What they mean when they say be genuine is appear genuine. But if you have to it's, tell yourself or tell someone to be think, genuine, you're not fucking being genuine. It's sad. It's sad. There's a lot of guilt because I don't think I'm the type of person that would want to take advantage of people or do that to people, but it's like you get into this weird trance almost, and then you get out of it and the rose colored glasses come out and then you're just like, holy shit, what just happened? <laughs> right. What you're talking about, that idea of feeling like everyone needs your help, this is something that cults... This is actually part of the cult ideology is that they want to break people down. They, they'll say things like, we're breaking you down to build you back up stronger. But actually what it oh, is, yeah. is, they want to get rid of your pre-cult identity that would kick in with rational thinking, critical thinking, objections. They want to break that down. They want to get you to saying yes and just listening to your mentor, and then they want to rebuild you with that new dual identity, that cult identity. And part of that is in a lot of cults, like, you know, a religious cult will say, we've been anointed by God. All these other people out in the world, their souls are doomed to go to hell or they're, they're, um, they have darkness within them and we need to like save them. So now you have this savior complex where you feel like you're anointed by God to save them, which again, if you feel like you're a warrior of God out here to save these damned souls, then you're not going to think critically about what you're doing. And these commercial cults, financial cults, like multi-level marketing companies, in my opinion, are, in my opinion, work. yeah, in my opinion, they do the exact same thing, except they use things that are 
equally as powerful, if not more powerful than people's relationship with God, which they do also use, but it's usually things like, think about how important money is. Don't you wanna retire your mom? Don't you see your parents struggling? Oh, your grandpa has cancer? Well, don't you wanna, these, these are like emotional triggers. No, no other job ever, no other career would your superior say to you something like that and make it personal and like, that, that would be a huge overstep. That would be them crossing a professional line, in my opinion. Imagine I'm working at a bank, I'm working at McDonald's, I'm working at a shoe store, anywhere. And my fucking boss came up to me and said like, well, you know, you should get those hours this weekend and really try to sell some shoes because your mom's cancer. It's like, what the fuck? Who the fuck are you to be telling me? Like, who the fuck are you, literally? But again, that's how they disarm you, you know? It, it takes it takes some time to um, to kind of reflect on that time. It took a lot of time to reflect on that experience. To me, it doesn't sound too much like you became really like indoctrinated because, like you said, you were careful with your parents. You weren't trying to recruit, so and ultimately, you weren't in it that like too too long. What was it? Two years? No, I two years. Like I said, I was. Thank God I, I was one of the lucky ones who didn't really buy into all of it. But there's still, like, I didn't think of it as an MLM, you know? Like, I didn't, it wasn't until afterwards where then I started to binge watch all the content where I was like, hang on a sec, I think this happened to me. And then you go through the stages of grief and you're just like i allow myself to be vulnerable well i wouldn't even say that you allowed yourself anything nobody chooses to be vulnerable nobody goes okay i'm ready no, to be vulnerable well, now you know it's it just happens there was, but there was a aspect where i was in a bit of a vulnerable position like i wasn't emotionally vulnerable but i was in a sense financially vulnerable i was looking for a different career path and they kind of showed me something nice and shiny and that nice and shiny turned to be like a plastic toy yeah well again that happens to everyone you know being financially oh, definitely. vulnerable so that that's something that super bothers me about these companies man and, and these cults is that like they make people who become vulnerable which is normal a normal part of life to go through ups and downs and they Absolutely. make people feel like they did something wrong or like they don't even realize till after the fact what happened. And I've said in my videos before, MLM is the only scam where you can look at somebody in the face, take their money in broad daylight and look at them and tell them, guess you didn't work hard enough because the system works for me. Look at me. It's going well for me. You know, it's so it's it's blameless in that way right because they're so nice to you these people who recruit you they're so nice to you oh you're not I gonna love bombing yeah you're not gonna go <laughs> yeah you're not gonna go to john the guy who recruited you who was so nice to you who was like motivating you all the time after a year of losing money you're not gonna go to him and be like what the fuck because he's gonna be like what it wasn't it wasn't i didn't do it like did you follow the system and it's like that, that part just really irks me because it's like, where is the recourse? Who do I, who can I blame? Who do I talk to about this? And I'm glad that that's finally changing with like the anti-MLM movement because these companies have been around People long. Up. Back in the day before the internet, these scams were still happening except people had nowhere to go and no one to talk to they already burnt their bridges trying to recruit everybody that they knew and there was no internet to go to to find some anti-MLM community so I I'm glad that that is changing because it, it can still be isolating despite that but I'm glad that there is at least some way for people to vent their frustrations and tell their stories now absolutely it's it's actually kind of funny because I the person, technically, the person that's that was above me, she got out before me, and we, not too long ago, got on to the topic about our experience. They were both like, yeah, fuck them. <laughs> it was a fucking scam. Which, weirdly enough, I'm still friends with her up line because they're like brother or sister. So they're, Again, I consider myself lucky that they never was like, oh, screw Josh, he, he failed at this. Like, he's, yeah. he's a loser, which was very prevalent. Like, if you, if you failed in the 
in the system or if you wanted to quit, you were a loser. That was said quite a few times. And you're just like, that's kind of rude to say to someone or about someone who may just think that this is not, not, not for them and calling them a loser. Like, who are you to judge? Listen, any, any MLM meeting that I have ever been to, watched a VOD of, watched a live stream of, watched a speech at their convention of, every single person who is high up has a rags to riches story and they say something to the effect of, if I can do this, you can do this. But then if somebody leaves, they'll say, well, the business isn't for everybody. We still need people out there to flip burgers and make our drinks. And it's like, you just start, you started with that person telling them if you can do it, they can do it as long as they're coachable and their mindset is right and they follow the system. And now it's not for everybody. Fuck you. Uh, pretty much. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh but this i was sorry i was gonna say like the nice thing kind of piggybacking on the whole uh there's a community growing is that as people are going through these mlms and coming out realizing what they went through i'm hoping that they've learned and are like now yeah, you got to you want to promote this business no thanks i'm good basically weeding out, slowly diminishing the potential recruits that these fuckers can get to. Totally. Yeah, totally, dude. <laughs> so after you got out, was there any sort of relief expressed from friends or family or like did this ruin any relationships of yours? Thankfully, no. Could have. It definitely could have. I was on a path of where I was starting to get a little too pushy with certain friends. And thankfully, they kind of said, you know, we're not going to discuss anything financial with you because we don't want to ruin our friendship with you. And I kind of took me a bit of a long time to realize that that was the best thing that they could have said to me, even though I was kind of that like, oh, well, good luck to you type of mentality. <laughs> it's, it's sad because I'm not that kind of person. I'm, right. I'm, gen I'm not that kind of person to think, oh, well, whatever, on to the next person. Like, no. Uh, so it, it's really, there's a lot of, like, realizing what the kind of demon you can turn into when, when, when uh, coached the wrong way. <laughs> and I mean, how indicative it is of the absolute brainwashing that goes on that you, somebody in a company that is losing money, you are losing money, could have this attitude like, if they only knew, about other people who are probably more secure in their job than you are with World Financial Group. And it's like, yet they can trick you to thinking, the company tricks you into thinking to like look down on those people. And it's like, what the fuck? Well, they, they kind of do the whole, oh, well, not, not the right time. I'll call you back sort of thing. But it's like, no. So cock. Okay, so you got out after two years and like I'm guessing you just accrued debt, right? Because you only sold a few policies in that time. So thankfully, the, my business was basically paying for the ah. fees. So that's where I kind of was like, I have to make this decision. Like this is starting to become too much of an expense. I can allocate this to something else. And so I just, it was around July. So June, July, they, you have to, that's when you're, um, as an agent, you have to, um, renew. Oh, what's the word? Renew. Thank you. You have to renew your, uh, your, uh, as an insurance person. So I just did not renew. I was like, uh, you know what? I'm good. And then I just, I quit. I formally resigned. I gave up my number and agent number and all that. And I was like, close everything. They even had the audacity. This was the end of June. They had the audacity to charge me July's, uh, uh, the, the fee, the back office. The, the, thank you. The back office fee. I'm like, you assholes. I didn't find it. Cause it was like $90. I was like, clearly you need it more than me. So take it as a charity. Yeah, that's so fucked. That's so fucked. <laughs> Fuck them. Fuck them. I almost wanted to fire, but I was like, you know what? 
my energy can be devoted to something way more positive to that negative energy. I mean, it's good that you had the other money from the other business that was sort of plugging the dam because a lot of people, you know, cults, oh, the first thing they try to do, the first thing cults try to do to take control of your life is get control of your time, dominate your time. That's why they tell people, you need to come to every meeting. You need to come to the optional trainings. You need to be committed. You yeah. need to be building your list. You need to be setting up meetings, appointments. Right. So they basically tell you, you need to be thinking about nothing but the business. Like I mentioned earlier with, you know, just talking right, to people, right, you have right. to like, be like, your focus is on like your business. Oh, you're, your uh, any time frame you have should be directed towards working on the business, basically. Right, right. And you said you were in the company two years, right? Two years. So total, you probably only lost like maybe a couple thousand dollars between all the fees and trainings and stuff, right? A couple thousand, yeah. Because there's also the, I only went, there's two conferences, the one in Banff, that's in January, and then the one in Vegas in July. I didn't go to the one in July because I was like, I don't have, I'm not going to financially, like, no. Like, it was going to be a retarded amount of, sorry, wrong word, stupid amount of money. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I can't justify spending it, but I did go to the one in Banff because uh, I was like, okay, it's more palpable financially it was like 300 dollars to sign up plus room there we shared rooms so we went it was at the very fancy bam hotel so you can oh, imagine how rooms yep, are like yep. right so <laughs> at the at the um what the fuck is the name of it uh, of the <laughs> I can't the bam let me see let me see let me see bam it's just the bam hotel ah fuck i forget the name of it the fairmont uh, bam the fairmont there you go. the fairmont, fairmont. yeah 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 very okay expensive, oh my god so. that's very expensive yeah like 800 bucks a night yeah but we shared there was like six of rooms we shared we shared a room between six people how the we fuck got very you, <laughs> how you share a room with six people how many beds well okay so there's two queens plus they got the suite so there's the two queens the polo couch so you just had to get okay with sharing a bed basically but <laughs> oh my goodness thankfully the people i was with like it's the people like the one girl that i'm really good friends with so we were like eh, no big deal Fuck, man. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, yeah, like, nothing screams financial freedom. Like, yeah. having to share a room with six other people. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Well, hey, man, the amount of money you spent and the experiences that you had, in the grand scheme of life, small price to pay for... Very small. I still, I really wish I would have taken that money that I spent and put it elsewhere. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, man. I mean, yeah, no, it's, it's, there's no point living in the past, but yeah. still, you're just like, ah, oh. but on the, I do kind of am weirdly glad I did because, like you said, it was a weird learning experience. You come out and then you, you get to self reflect on the type of person you are, kind of, in, in a weird way because you're like, I just went through this experience and made some not good life choices and you get to say never again well hey if you want uh i don't know if you have a social media for your business but we can put it here if anybody wants to if anyone's in calgary and needs their house clean and wants to support josh's business let's so, we, can, we can put that i'm so far i'm on facebook mostly i'm busy and i don't have a whole lot of time updating social media but okay. on facebook you can find me under the cinder fella i love it thank you so and i do have an instagram i post a couple pictures uh same one the cinder fella y'all might you might have to raise your prices if uh, you're already busy <laughs> and then people start trying to hit you up for business well i i'm proud to say that i finally got to the part point where this year I actually have to start hiring. So Woo! yeah, so recruiting. Uh, wanna... <laughs> I go right. Yeah. I, I'm not hiring. I'm recruiting you to run your own business. Right. <laughs> With yes, yes. I mean, you're really. That's really. That's really boss babe. Where? Next level stuff that's that you're right, doing right that's now. That's true. 
boss babe <laughs> going through 2020, starting your own business during the pandemic and getting to a point where you can start hiring employees. Yeah. I never thought I'd be the type of person that is very entrepreneurial, but I mean, hey. Yeah, hashtag financial freedom, hashtag entrepreneur, hashtag girl boss, hashtag boss babe, hashtag whatever. <laughs> hashtag MLM. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. All right, so, cool. Well, uh, Josh, if there's anything else you want to add, go for it. Okay, last but not least, but if you are someone who is struggling with financial issues, Please, please, please do not go to WFG and go to a reputable financial planner. Pay the fee and get your shit sorted. Fuck them. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. Really appreciate it, man. Um, I appreciate you and what you do. Yes, thank you so much. All right, bro. Have a great rest of your day and yeah, uh, appreciate it. All the best in the business, too.